delighted to say we have Keith Wood and Francois Pinar with us from uh, from Adair Manor, Keith, no less, I think. No, um, Ger, we are in the International Rugby Experience on O'Connell Street in Limerick. Very good. Well, tell us a bit about it because uh, we've been talking about this for a couple of years and finally it's open. It has. I mean, it, it, it started, the genesis of it was about six years ago with a conversation with J.P. McManus and Paul O'Connell and about trying to do something in the heart of Limerick that would benefit the city in terms of income uh, by way of tourists and being an additional hook for tourists and also uh, you know for Limerick being a fairly special place for for rugby over history and not having something to do just with Limerick but to have an international element of it so um, I joined they asked me to join them at that stage and we built out a list of international names of people to talk to to see who they get involved. We spoke to 320 players of the game. They all said yes. Uh, all um, uh, delivered voluntarily, actually, to this. And so for the last couple of days, we've dragged about 20 of them over to um, to here and to Adair uh, just for the official launch of the international experience. And it's been phenomenal. It's been great and really well received. And uh, it's, it's pretty amazing stuff. Yeah, Francois, good morning to you. How are you? Very good, and you? Yeah, very good. We're delighted to have you with us. Um, what's it like? Because obviously, I, this I guess this is the first time most people will have seen it. What was your first impressions when you got there? Well, coming back here to Limerick is a hate-love experience for me, basically because in 1999, I played for Saracens at Tormund Park when this uh, man next to me uh, scored a try in the last second of the game to beat us. Uh, so that wasn't good. Uh, but coming back to this experience is very good. <laughs> very good. Coming back to this experience has been a, a joy. What they've done here uh, for for the city and and for rugby, not only Irish rugby, English rugby, world rugby, is quite special. And the storytelling is going to continue. That's what I like about the whole experience. Is they are telling stories and showcasing great moments in the game, and we know that there are many more great moments that's going to come. So uh, it's not a museum, but it's an experience where you can interactively engage with uh, whatever team you want to and follow players and pick your own player and measure yourself against Johnny Wilkinson's kicks and Fox the Clerks passing. So I think what they've done here and the generosity um, of, of spirit uh, is, is fabulous. It's quite beautiful that we have you both together because I think, Keith, we asked you to pick your, your best 15 that you played against not too long ago on the show one morning and, and Francois made the cut at number six. Uh, I think you described him then as, as uh, still statesman-like and you, you described that, that, how that moment in 95 with Mandela was a defining moment for yourself as well. Uh, it was. I mean, look, I, I try not to call him statesman-like in person because <laughs> any, any boost... Lucky he made the cut, right? <laughs> last last night when we had a glass of wine, he was abusing me. Yeah, <laughs> it deserved, of course, but um, it's lovely, the rivalry and camaraderie. And actually, the rivalry when you're playing against, and we played against each other for, I suppose, nine or ten years, and um, when you play against each other, you... Uh, you know, you have this huge rivalry and you want to beat them and um, and you don't get on and you often don't get on. And but that's respect. It, it is. That's, that's, no, that's, it is. And it's respect for one another. And then you get the chance as a, a couple of pairs of has-beens to, um, you know, to have a glass of wine, to have a conversation, to play a game of golf, to help each other with different things. And Francois has set up an extraordinary foundation uh, called Make a Difference on the back of that statesman-like conversation that he had in 1995 and then you want to be able to help different people do different things. So the friendships that are, have been forged in rivalry last forever. So that's been quite extraordinary. And it's and been a lovely camaraderie. And, and there's been a lovely element here of people who've played with each other, played against each other, um, who've watched other other people play. So we've had a load of the, of, of the women's team in around. And obviously we haven't played against them. But the conversations are the same, the crack is the same, the camaraderie is the same. It's been pretty fantastic. Now, rugby is special in that way, you know, when you, and coming back to that word respect, it's the respect for the competitiveness in the beast that's standing across the, the field from you, that this guy wants to win as much as we want to win. But where rugby is wonderful is you can then have a competition, it's full on, and afterwards, you have a beer, and you, and you and the same with the crowds. I mean, yeah, the crowds can sit next to one another at a rugby game, 
um, obviously support their team and after the game shake hands and say well done uh, and move on. So that's why rugby is for me so special. It's given me so much in my life. Can I uh, just, Francois, uh, maybe my maths are, are right or maybe they're wrong, but it feels to me, uh, if uh, if my dates are correct, it's literally half your life ago that you won the World Cup. So you've been a World Cup winner for literally half your life. Is that right? 28 years either side of that? Yeah, you're almost there. I'm 56, um, 57 now. So your maths is 100%. Well, I was 28. He definitely had some plastic work done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Purely, purely restorative, Keith. It has been an incredible... You know, I, I, I say this n- not, not to sound glib. I'm probably one of the f- most fortunate rugby players in the world to have shared that special moment in our country's history with one of the greatest leaders the world has ever seen. And to try and describe to people what happened in our country, it's just too emotional. It really is too emotional. The stories I hear 28 years later um, is... Uh, it's fascinating and it, ha- it hasn't stopped, especially, you know, when I, when I travel from Cape Town to Johannesburg and I get on the plane, mostly it'll be black people that say to me, good morning, my captain. And then my heart just go, wow, because that moment left, left a mark um, on, on everybody because of hope, because of Mr. Mandela, not because of you know, myself and the team. Obviously, we had to play our role, but he came out and supported this team and, and winning it was special. And that gave the country hope to build um, a, a, a dem- democratic South Africa. You know, to go from apartheid to democracy without a, without violence, it's just been because of his leadership, Woody. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it was it's one of those things. I um, uh, I wasn't part of it because I went to the World Cup, uh, got injured very quickly in one of it, uh, and but when I was sitting in my hospital bed getting my shoulder reconstructed, that was on the screen. Really? That was one of the last things I saw before I went under wow. under anaesthetic. So, um, and it was look, it was game changing for South Africa. And it was game changing for the game actually, and uh, and it need, it kind of needed it needed it to be on a world stage. That was the world stage, and it turned out perfectly for you when you won at the end. Yeah, course. what has made it really really special is Sia um yeah. and and you know South Africa winning it with a with a black captain has really been important for us. Um, there's so many kids that are coming through that never had the opportunity to play because uh, of various reasons are now getting the opportunity. And you see the talents coming through. It's quite spectacular. Mokazola and Pimpi look on your arm. You know, you've got Busse uh, Noche. A lot of these players tell their stories. And the Sia Kulisi story is incredible it's story. It's extraordinary. And that again gives, and that's where sport is so powerful. We're going to see it again this year at the Rugby World Cup. When everybody is hoping, rivalry comes back again. <laughs> I think that's allowed. Yeah. yeah. And on the 28th of, uh, of October, there'll be a, a bunch of uh, young men that would have the privilege of being called uh, Rugby World Champions. It, it's hard to believe, uh, Francois, that Mandela will be 10 years dead, I think, later this year, in December, in fact. So, uh, did I recall correctly that I remember you, you, you talking about hearing that news that he had passed away and, and how it impacted you perhaps more than you had, had felt it would, regardless of the fact that he was sick for some time? Yeah, I actually was at a cricket game in Johannesburg and my phone was off and I got back to the hotel room and I switched my phone on and the first message I got, it was an SMS, was from Philip Sela, um, one of my great heroes. I played with him at, at, at Saracens, just a superb man. My yeah, he just said to me, I'm so sorry. And the next message was from Abdelatif Benazi. And then I realized Mr. Mandela has passed. So I phoned my, my wife and said to her, we were going to go on holiday, um, that I'm not going to travel with them uh, because I'll be at the funeral. And Noreen said, the boys have already said, we're canceling holiday. We're definitely going. And I, then, I said to her, I'm switching off my phone because it's going off, off the hook. It's just ringing. I switched off the phone and I switched on the telly. And I surfed the channels. And in South Africa, they, they thought that if Mr. Mandela passes, then there's going to be upheaval. You know, there will be unrest. It was totally the opposite. People spilled out onto the streets and they were hugging one another and they were embracing this, this beautiful man that, uh, that came out of prison after 27 years with, uh, with forgiveness in his heart. And as I went through all these channels, CNN, Sky, BBC, it was just the most incredible tributes. And I sat there on my bed and I was really tearful. Um, and blessed that I had that privilege to, I don't want to say, uh, to, to get close to it. And, and it actually happened after the World Cup. So before the World Cup, yes, there were interactions, but it was after the World Cup where 
just the privilege my wife and I are having a breakfast with him, um, just talking about stuff, you know, and then he would call us uh, uh, with the boys and we would go and, 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 you know, just have lunch with him and talk about stuff, you know, so this was quite special. Yeah, Francois, I was wondering, like, your, your life obviously changes significantly and you have to be ready for the statesman-like stuff because you could have just been a rugby player but you then had to uh, wear the importance of being world champions and, and foster that relationship with Nelson Mandela. It seems, talking to you today, that you've worn that quite lightly but I guess there's a, a constant pressure as well at some point in in, in actually living up to the potential that being South Africa's Rugby World Cup winning captain at that moment has? Um, I, I, it, we have a responsibility um, as, as captains. You're leading your country and, and playing for uh, for the British and Irish Lions. You have a responsibility because people look up to you. Uh, the young kids uh, um, admire you and they want to play in your position. So there, there's a, a responsibility that you an innate that you have from a you know from from the first time that you were given the captaincy to lead your country. And I think I'm no different to you or to any other captain uh, in that sense of responsibility. Um, but having touched the great man has, has changed my life, but it's not only my life. If you go and speak to people that have really um, been able to get a little bit closer to Mr. Mandela, he would have changed their lives too. He just had that aura that it's very difficult to explain to people over the radio. Yeah? It's, it's an aura where you're, the first time I had tea with him, after he became president, um, I was I was summoned to tea, and and I tell the story. It's, you'll see it. It's, I was so nervous, and he came out of his office uh, in this booming voice, and I stood up and I said to him, "Good morning, Mr. Mandela," and he said to me, "Hui more Francois," in my language, and then I said to him, uh, "How are you?" and he said to me, "Hu kan met your ma and your pa? How's it going with your mom and your dad?" in my language. So it was just incredible. He just disarms you, um, not that you arm. But it makes you feel at peace. Then he touched my hand and he, we, we walked into his office to go and have tea. Afterwards, and we were talking about, he told me stories about being on Robben Island. He told me stories about the boycotts and about Barcelona, the Olympics. And, but he always wanted to know about me. And then uh, Mary, his, uh, his PA kept on coming into the office saying, There's, because there were, there were presidents waiting to meet him. And, and she said, the time's up. And he would say... I'm talking to my captain. So afterwards, I I, I left and and I, I just when I reflected on it, sitting in the car, um, there was two distinct feelings um, that that I had. One was that I I was in the presence of a wise and caring man, and the second one was quite bizarre. I felt safe. I felt really that this leader is a, a true leader. That that when he speaks, he really wants to follow through, and it's just not rhetoric. And how oftentimes do we get leaders that there's rhetoric but no follow through? But he wasn't. He wasn't like that. He was definitely one that followed through. You carry that for the rest of your life, though. I suppose that's the point I'm, I'm making, and that you 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 didn't you didn't keep that to yourself. It would have been very easy to be like you know, almost burdened by the fact that all right, I I have to represent him and I have to represent his community and the community that I've come from, and that's going to be difficult for me. But he seemed to give you a, a sense of freedom and embolden you to do that. Yes. Um, for uh, my children, I, it's, it's through your, your your kids that you learn most. Um, now they've had the opportunity to meet Mr. Mandela. Um, he gave them Koza names, Mkokeli and Goha. Mkokeli means leader, and that's John's name, and Goha, the brave one, because Stefan asked him. Uh, every time they speak about Mr. Mandela and the interactions that they've had with him, it's just with the greatest of respect. I'm just blessed. I really am lucky to have had that moment um, on, on a podium with him. But there's certain things that will never be in the public domain, you know, really private conversations that we've also had. And that I, I treasure because I had the opportunity to have really intimate conversations with, 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 with him. Yeah, we, we miss him in South Africa uh, because we're going through some, some political turmoil at the moment. Keith, I suppose that's the whole point of the uh, international rugby experience in Limerick is that we get to talk about these stories and they are definitely rugby stories. They are rugby stories. It's funny, we were looking at this and um, we were going through it yesterday. I, I, I haven't been here for four months and we've been doing a lot of work behind the scenes, but 
but I haven't been here for four months and deliberately so that I could try and see it in its finished state. And it isn't in its finished state. It is phenomenal. And the interactive elements is fantastic. And the stories and the storytelling and the story building are fantastic. Um, but it'll be a bit more iterative and we'll add more to it and we'll have uh, more personal experiences and more different things that kind of uh, strike a chord with other people. Um, but we've been looking at that idea of, you know, when, when we get rugby players that are in the town or in the country, we want to bring them down here. We want, we want them to be able to see what this is about. We want to learn more about them. We want to gather more pieces um, so that this is a living and, and breathing experience. And there has to have elements of... Um, has to have a few elements of um, uh, not museum but uh, memorabilia and things like that but this has to be living and breathing it has to be part and parcel of the city as well so it, it, it should appeal to rugby fans it does appeal to rugby fans of course it does it appeals to kids but it should also appeal to tourists and people who want to have a sense of the idea of a place and the idea of a sport within that place in that context so it's been I mean, it's been a labour of love. And I, one of the things I would say that when we started talking to rugby people about it, when, and uh, it includes all of us that are involved in it, it's people gave us their time voluntarily. And it was part of that spirit of the game, that this was something that was required. So, you know, JP has put a huge amount of money into this and has built this as a building. And for the next, let's say, 10 years, I don't know what the life of an experience is, but let's say it's 10 years, this is going to be living and breathing rugby in the city. It will be repurposed to do something else afterwards, but this will be a building for sport, for, for good and glory mm. for, for, for Limerick. So he wanted to build a cathedral to sport, and it was cathedral to, to rugby. They call Limerick the city of spires. You can see them out here. We're up on the sixth floor looking out and across on the, on the top of the rooftops of Limerick. Um, and Limerick needs a bit of extra love as well, and this will be part of the regeneration of the place as well. So important to relive those experiences, and, and it's beautiful that you get to look over Limerick when you do them as well, and and not to, to bring up the, the, the bad experiences for you, Francois, and Limerick, but we've had the pleasure, as I said, of Keith uh, talking about how much he enjoyed playing against you. What was it like coming up against that, as you, you said, uh, the beast that you have respect for, and, and those experiences of playing that, that great monster team? Uh, Woody is a warrior. You know, he's a warrior. He's a, if he was in South Africa, he would be a Zulu warrior. Um, always, always competitive. You always know you're in for a game. You know, he just hates losing. I hate losing. And that's where, <clears throat> excuse me, that's where the respect comes from is that you know that it's going to be 80 minutes and there's going to be no give. It's just going to be uh, flat out. That's what I love. And when I said hate relationship, it was one of the, I think it's one of the best games that I've played okay. against you. We just went from one side of the field to the other side of the field to the other side of the field. Great memory. The fact that we lost, yeah, it hurt, but it, was, it was gone the next day. That's, that's 23 or 4 years ago. And uh, it's as clean and clear in my mind as it was then. And it was the, the reason we scored the try. I, the hero of that piece is neither of us, it turns out. It was actually Mick Galway. Um, the uh, I'd made a mistake and he'd scored a try under the post. It was my fault. I was tired. It was 77 minutes. And we were standing underneath the goalposts and Golov pulled all the team in and said, this is what we're going to do now. We're going to win the, the, the kickoff. We're going to hold on to it until we get a penalty. We're going to kick into the touch. We're going to hold on to it again until we get another penalty. We're going to kick it to the corner and we're going to score. And it was as if he was seeing into the future and it just went there and there and there. <clears> and one of, one of my former teammates, Nick Walsh, was your scrum half. Yeah. I moved from Harlequins and uh, it was almost uh, saddening to run through him to score at the end, but it was a little flop over. I, my memory says you crawled over the line. My memory says um, there could have been a penalty. Not a chance. Our way, not a chance. Yeah, the rivalry persists and uh, it's clear you guys really get on very well together. Uh, Keith, are you going to give us a quick little virtual tour there before we wrap? No, my skills are not the, the best in the world, but I'm going to give you a little look out down O'Connell Street in Limerick. Oh, yeah. So this is, we're up at the very top here. Oh, it's scenic, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Brilliant. nice view. Uh, yeah, we go in there. When you're not looking at the shine off the top of my head. It makes it <laughs> somewhat... Visible There's from space. 
There's Frankie over there. Uh, you can look all the way down to um, to King John's Castle down over there. I'm not giving you a tour of the place. It's six stories. We've been running up and down this for the last two days, and it's been quite something, I have to say. Uh, the great and the good of World Rugby did show up, not just Francois Pinar, but loads of people. Um, oh, oh, Brian O'Driscoll's head just popped in there. Yeah, he's, 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 not, he's not allowed to come up here. Uh, Brian O'Driscoll, Brian Squared. We had Brian O'Driscoll, Brian, Brian, Squared, Brian yeah. Habana, uh, Martin Johnson, uh, Kira Griffin is is downstairs at the moment. Uh, wait, look, it was it was phenomenal, wasn't it? Sean, Fitzy Sean, Fitzy Sean, Fitzy Sean Fitzpatrick. Fitzy. I was going to, trying to leave Fitzy out of it a little bit. <laughs> there's been, I mean, there's been an awful lot of fun. It has been, in some respects, and I have to say, you do get a little bit privileged for, when these things happen. Um, but it has been a little bit like a reunion, yeah. And um, and that's been pretty cool. Well, you're part of a continuum, and I think that's the whole point of the cathedral to sport as well, that you're part of it and you're, yeah. you're sharing your stories. It's been brilliant to spend some time in your company. My thanks to Keith Wood and to Francois Pinar this morning. Cheers, lads. Cheers, Cheers guys. guys. 21 minutes past eight this morning here. Um, Michael Hill says, I'm not a big rugby fan, but Francois and Keith interview pure class, great film. Maybe Keith can be in the next one. <laughs> yeah, uh, we'd need to... Um, we need to win the World Cup, though. That's the that's the bit. <laughs> you forget what sport does is that like those lads played against each other, as you say, like a lifetime ago. Literally, for 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 me, it's a lifetime ago, and yet they remember those. They remember moments from matches and moments after matches. And forever, pints, forever, literally. Uh, they remember it today as if it was yesterday. So it's beautiful to see it in the friendship that that still persists. Clearly, yeah. The lesson is play sport for as long as you can. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, and hold on to the memories. You know, you don't appreciate it at the time. I'd say, I'd say a lot of people, sport, sports people feel that way, but um, clearly those lads appreciated it at the time and still do. Uh, 